Well, we want to just spend a few moments before we go today looking at God's Word together. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. We've been in a series called Kingdom Secrets, a series about the parables of Jesus. And parables are just simple stories, stories that Jesus told as he was uh, teaching the crowd, stories about everyday life. Stories about, uh, uh, about farming and stories about investing and, and different things. And, but these stories had much deeper meaning than just the, the stories themselves. And so we've called this series Kingdom Secrets because uh, these stories reveal secrets about God, about us, about how we relate to God, about God's kingdom, then God's rule over this earth and this universe. And so we're going to look at a, a, two stories today, two very short stories that have a whole lot to do with what you just heard on stage in this performance. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be talking about secret treasure today. Have you ever discovered secret treasure? Treasure hidden somewhere, something maybe a value that, that someone else missed, but you were able to see the value that was there. You were able to discover secret treasure. I had that happen to me once, although it was short-lived. Uh, back when I was uh, in junior high, high school, somewhere around there, I, um, I had this collection of baseball cards. It was not a collection I put together. Someone just gave me a box of baseball cards, and I held on to them. They were in my closet for a while. Uh, but then in, in uh, 98, 1998, uh, something happened that, that was really significant. Um, in Major League Baseball, there was uh, the home run race. You guys remember that? So Roger Maris, way back 37 years before that, had set the record for the most home runs in a single season. And then in 1998, Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire were battling it out to see who would be able to pass Roger Maris's record and end up being the, the one with the most home runs in a single season. They went back and forth the whole season, but Mark McGuire broke the record first and then set the new record, 70 home runs in a single season. And then it dawned on me, I have a Mark McGuire baseball card in my collection. And I pulled it out, and it was before his rookie year when he played on the U.S. Olympic team, and I looked it up, and it was worth hundreds of dollars at that point. And my goal was, let's grow this value because he's going to end up in the Hall of Fame, and this card is going to be worth a fortune. Guess what it's worth today? You can buy it on eBay for 10 whole dollars. What happened? Well, yes, he set the record, but three years later, Barry Bonds broke the record, ended up with 73 home runs. And then it turned out that all of them were indicted for taking performance-enhancing drugs. <laughs> wah, wah. No Hall of Fame, no records, nothing. And my card now is worth about $10. But for a short period of time, I had a card that was worth a lot. And that felt really, really good. Don't we all want to find that thing? That thing that, that has uh, immeasurable value that would change our lives forever? Aren't we looking for that? Don't we hope that could happen someday? That's what happened in our story in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 44. Read along with me. This is about two men who find that kind of treasure. It says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And when he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. Secret treasure. Two men who find treasure. And what we see from these two accounts is that the only thing truly worth anything is going to end up costing you everything. The only things in life that really are worth anything, and the one thing that truly is worth something in life, is going to cost you everything. We see very uh, similar accounts here of these two different men. There are some differences, but a lot of similarities. And the three similarities that we see show us the meaning of these two stories. And the first thing that we see is a discovery of great significance. Both men discover something significant. The first one discovers treasure. Hidden treasure buried in a field. How many of you have been uh, so lucky as to, while you're gardening or while you're farming, to stumble upon a buried treasure? How many? Yeah, it doesn't really happen today, right? But it, it would sometimes happen back then because uh, today we've got banks and safety deposit boxes and home security systems and safes. And so you don't go and bury your treasure today. 
No, there's other ways of taking care of your valuables. But back then, they didn't have the elaborate banks that we have and the security systems and the safes. No, instead, they would take their valuables, and, and especially if they were in a rush, like if there was an enemy that was invading the nation, which happened from time to time, you'd go out and find the, the best place you can find that you can remember where it was, bury your stuff, and hope it's still there when you come back to it. But then inevitably, over time, Someone passes away, the place where they bury it's forgotten, centuries may even go by, and the treasure is there hidden just waiting for someone to find it. That seems to be what the story is talking about. That, that in this uh, field, there's a treasure, and probably this guy was a common laborer doing work for the farmer who owned the field, and he's out plowing the field and stumbles upon this treasure. And what does he do when he finds it? He reburies it. And then he sells everything he has so he has enough money to purchase that field and then he's able to possess the treasure. Now some of us would get a, a little nervous about the morality being taught in this story. Isn't it immoral to hide the fact that you found a treasure by the guy's field and then try to possess the treasure? But see, back in this day, under rabbinical law, that is the Jewish law, uh, if you found the treasure, you kept the treasure. We, we have similar things. It's not in our laws today, but we have similar adages. Have you ever heard possession is? Kids, how about finders keepers? We know how this works. And for them, he was able to possess the treasure by finding it. But just to make sure there was no doubt that the treasure is his, he buries it, sells everything, buys the field, and not only did he buy the field, but he had great joy in buying the field because the discovery was that significant. The other man was similar, but, but a little bit different. He was a merchant, probably a wealthy merchant, and he would buy and sell, and he was searching out for fine pearls. Pearls were very valuable in this day. There were no fake pearls, and so these were truly, truly valuable things. And he was searching for, for these priceless pearls and then finally finds one. One that, that is so much beyond his imagination. And he also sells everything in order to buy the pearl. And that's the second similarity between these two stories. Both men were able to discern the value on which they found. Discernment of great value. When they saw it, they knew it. This is worth everything. The first man, we don't know what the treasure was. Could have been jewels, could have been pearls, could have been gold bullion or silver bullion. We don't know what it was. But whatever it was, without a doubt, he knew it was worth everything. And for the man searching for the pearls, it says that he was searching for fine pearls, plural. But he finds one pearl that was priceless. And he found it, saw it, realized that it was everything he dreamed of and more which led to both of these men making a decision, a decision of great sacrifice, that they were willing to give everything in order to purchase this field, to get the treasure, to purchase this pearl that he had found. What would be for you something worth everything you own? Think about all that you own, your cars, your house, your business, if you're a business owner your stuff, everything that you possess, what would it take for you to sell it all? For these men, it was this treasure. It was this pearl. They moved all their chips into the center of the table. They went all in. There was no plan B. It was a risky move. They bet the farm on these things. But notice, neither man regretted their decision. They made the right choice. In fact, as I already mentioned, the first man, it says, in his joy, sold everything. I mean, not only did he sell everything, but he was happy to do so. He couldn't wait to do so. And the second man, he was a, a business owner. He, he was a merchant. He knew how to buy and sell. And he realized that this, even though he calculated out, was a, a risk worth taking. And neither man regretted their decision. Which brings us to our time today. You all have made a discovery by being here. A discovery of great significance. You've heard of the greatest treasure that this world has ever seen. The coming of Jesus Christ. It's a treasure that is beyond any other treasure you could possibly search after or long after. 
Do you realize what you just heard? And you may be asking, how is that a treasure? I'd much rather have a fine pearl or, or buried treasure, but how is this worth anything? Well, think about it. The good news that, that we have, the, the gospel we call it, is that we, you and me, were created by God to have a relationship with him. And then we said no to God and that relationship. We walked away. We did things our own way. And in doing so, we messed everything up. Now we have to face disease, famine, suffering, pain, death, strife, wars, all of that because we said no to God's way. And yet God didn't leave us in our mess. Instead, God became a man. Jesus Christ was born in a dirty, filthy, stinky stable as a baby. And then did the thing that none of us could ever do. He lived a perfect life. A life that was pleasing to God. But instead of being rewarded for such a life, he went to the cross, died a brutal death. A death that you and I deserved because of our sin, because of the mess that we have created. And yet Jesus took all of our mess upon himself as he died on the cross and then did not stay dead, but walked away from the grave, proving that he was able to pay the price for our sin and he was able to conquer death, showing that you and I have the chance to live forever, to be brought into God's family because of Jesus. That is what all of us are offered. That is a treasure truly worth having. Because anything else that we go after eventually is going to come to nothing. Just like my baseball card. At the end of the day, it will be worth nothing. Think about the stuff that, that you go after. Kids, think of that thing that you want most of all for Christmas. That one thing that you would be happy if you got that one thing. Guess what? About a month after you get it, or maybe a year after you get it, if you're lucky, five years after you get it, guess what? It's going to be broken. I don't have a single toy from my childhood. They all broke. How about us adults? What is it that we go after? What is it that you want more than anything? Is it power and influence? Guess what? That will fade. Is it wealth and riches? Guess what? That will fade. Is it a significant relationship with someone, a trusted relationship? Guess what? Even if the relationship lasts for your entire life, at some point it will end, either by you dying or them dying. And it doesn't matter how much you amass in this life, at some point you will die. And as they say, you never see a U-Haul following a hearse. You can't take it with you. That's why there are so many stories of treasure hunters. Because rich, wealthy, powerful people, kings and queens and pharaohs and all of these people amassed all kinds of riches. And they were buried with those riches, hoping they could take them with them into the next life. And guess what? There are treasure hunters because the treasure is still there. That's why we have such a thing called a grave robber. Because the treasure is still in the grave. But there is something that is worth far more than any of that because it's the one thing that will last forever and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the question for you today is, are you able to discern the value of what you have heard? And then you're faced with a choice. What do you do with what you know? Are you able to make a decision of great sacrifice? You may ask, how can I get this kind of treasure? How can I get a relationship with Jesus? What do I have to do? And the answer is, there's nothing you can do because Jesus has already done it for you. And all you have to do is believe in who Jesus is and what he has done. That he is who he said he is, God in human form. And that he did what he said he would do in going to the cross and rising from the grave and now offers you forgiveness, eternal life, the fullness of life, that everything that you have ever done in life that you regret, everything that you are ashamed of is now washed away. And now you have the life that Jesus lived given to you free of charge simply by believing in him. 
But do you remember what I said? I said the one thing that is truly worth anything will end up costing you everything. Faith, while easy, is also very, very costly. Because faith changes everything. Jesus warns us about all of this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, where he says this, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your heart is, that's a way of saying what you believe. It's what you have faith in. And if you have faith in Jesus, then that is going to be where your treasure is. That will be what you value most. And the moment you begin to believe in the reality of Jesus and what he has done for you, everything in your life will begin to change. Because if Jesus truly is God who came in human flesh, lived a perfect life, died on the cross and rose from the grave, and if you have a chance of living eternity beyond this life, then that will change everything about how you live today. It will change your relationships. It will change how you spend money, what you value, how you talk, how you act. It will literally change your entire life. And the question is, are you willing to give yourself to Jesus? As the kids sang earlier, what do you give to the king that has everything? You give yourself. The one thing truly worth anything will end up costing you everything. That decision now sits before you. What will you do with the treasure of Jesus Christ? If you want to talk with someone more about this, we have people that have orange lanyards around their neck as our prayer team. They would love to talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to sacrifice your life for him, what it means to give your life to Jesus and follow him. We would love for you to make that choice today and you can talk with one of them about that afterwards. At this time, I'm gonna pray and invite our worship team up to help us respond through a couple songs. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift that you have given us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you did not leave us in our mess, but Lord, you came to us and you saved us. I thank you, Lord, that there is nothing we can do except believe in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And I pray that everyone here will have made that choice to believe, to give you their lives, that we could have the fullness of life and hope of a life beyond this life. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.